Okay, that's on, and now I've got sound, but I don't know if I brought everybody with me. What's the best option here? Do you have? It'd be great if you could call. Is it working for you? Okay. So is uh, so is um, so is space. Um, and so what, what uh, Tom is trying to do is um, load up a, a live stream on uh, YouTube, and he's got it kind of working. I Sorry, so the, the issue that's going on is that we're trying to Skype in two committee members. And so bringing in people at the same time is hard because it's, it's organizing to get both. And when the screen closed on the last PowerPoint, that ended the stream because that was the completion of the stream. So now I'm trying to get them back connected to us without being connected to us. So I apologize. It's not that we don't have the stuff. It's that we're trying to get two people not in this room back together with us. We're actually live right now. We have two people actually watching, so that's good. Okay. Yeah, I can write down what's the. I'm in the process of putting and pasting. I got the wrong thing. I got to get the G. I got to paste down the G. Uh, yeah. So. Is that the? Oh, okay. I got. I got. I got. Okay. Yeah. That might take them to the. Yeah. Oh, okay. Let me see. Hold on. I might be able to. Oh, we have four people actually watching. So th there's actually four people watching. I switched. I had to. I can actually. Hi, John. Okay, so I'm sorry about all this. This is this is uh, just a matter of getting these two to to work together. So if you went to the last um, the last live link, it should take you to the live feed that that just concluded when when I closed the PowerPoint. If you go back to YouTube, you should see if you're at that page, you should be able to find. Um, my name, and there should be uh, in my channel live events. And I just made a new one so we could actually have that. Okay. Good, you're hearing me. Okay, great. That's exactly what we want. You're going to be slightly delayed from what we have here, but you won't, uh, but that's just because it has to upload the, the file. Great. Then then I'll give you hand you back to Karin.
Steve, I think, is here, actually. We have a number of people watching. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. All right. So sorry about the delay. Uh, unfortunately, doing live events at the same time doesn't always go as smoothly as you'd like, but hopefully the, the presentation will make up for that. So Karin introduced Lampreys. That was a phenomenal introduction. Thank you, Karin. And I really have appreciated working with you and also here at ESF. I've really enjoyed my time here and a chance to do this work. Uh, what we're going to spend some time talking about today is lampreys. I'm actually going to close my live YouTube so I don't have to hear myself while I'm talking because that's only a little bit annoying. You can't hear it, but I can. It sounds like bees in my throat. So I'm going to talk about lampreys, and I did a lot of work with market capture of lampreys, and I'm trying to understand a uh, little more about the ecology, especially of the larvae of lampreys. This is a, a good picture of, of uh, some different sizes of lampreys, and of course sizes are probably also associated with ages. I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. I had a lot that I wanted to put in here that I probably couldn't because of time limits. So uh, if you are interested in this topic and you think that, wow, Tom probably left out some stuff, that's in fact the case, and I would love to talk about it with you, so please do ask me questions. Lampreys, I think, are clearly unusual when you talk about fish, right? So a fish as we traditionally see it is something at the top, right? Actually, this is a native fish in New York, so you can go and find these. Um, but the fish that we see, in it, that we generally think about, have things like what we call paired fins, right? Fins that are paired, you have them, their arms and legs. They also have things like uh, really big uh, fins for maneuvering, um, and they have and they have scales. Scales is something that we think about associated with fish. That's something that lampreys don't have, but we think that fish generally do. They also have one cover over their gills, right? It's just a flap. It covers their gills. If you lift it, you can see their gills, and that's something that lampreys, again, don't have. Lampreys really don't look like fish in the traditional sense. And I think the most obvious one that people come away with, well, lampreys, are these really fish? Are these really what are these things is that lampreys don't have jaws. And I have a, a lot of people get really nervous when I say that lampreys don't have jaws. It seems to really upset them. Actually, most organisms that you think of don't have jaws built in the same fashion as yours, right? So you think of jaws based on a vertebrate model, but that's a relatively different model from all the other ways that animals go about tearing up food particles. So not having jaws is actually not that uncommon. And lampreys, as a result, because they don't have a jaw, they have a disc, and in that disc there are usually teeth, and then there's some sort of tongue or rasping apparatus, and that's used to, to peel away or pull away materials to expose it so they can actually consume it. The other thing about lampreys that you should know before we get started is this is a, this is a geologic timeline. Uh, lampreys are really, really old, right? Lampreys are not what we think of when we think of a traditional fish, and that's because they're not from our time, right? We think of, of recent fish as being somewhere probably in the Cenozoic. Actually, a lot of the animals that we deal with have evolved in that period. Right now, we're listed, we're right up here, right? We're right on this orange line, and in fact, the orange line is much thicker than all of human history. But lampreys uh, appear much, much earlier than that. Our first fossil lamprey appears about 360 million years ago, right? And, and it looks like a lamprey, right? That's, in fact, exactly what the fossil looks like. You can see it top side, bottom side, and, and uh, on the lateral. And what you can see is that the, uh, the animal is a lamprey. So it's a very obvious animal. So by that point in time, lampreys are already doing what lampreys do now, probably. Lampreys and hagfish. Hagfish are another member. Lamprey people look down on hagfish people. Hagfish people look down on lamprey people. The hagfish are these pink, ugly worms that live at the bottom of the sea. They're really unusual, but they're really, really cool. And it looks like genetically that they are the, the most recent common ancestor. Or they, they, they belong in the same group with lampreys. And so at some point, uh, they, are, they broke away from each other. And that was probably about 500 million years ago. Uh, and if you look at the animals around at that time, what you'll see is that they look a lot like lampreys. They're these long cylindrical body plans. Sometimes they're flattened, sometimes they're not, uh, with some sort of head apparatus and no mouth. Or I should say no, no jaw, right? This looks sort of like a jaw the way it's, it's drawn, but that does not close like you think of with a fish mouth. That's an open disc, again, that does some sort of moving around inside of that. And so if you look at the time period where lampreys come out of, lampreys aren't that unusual. They sort of sit in there. Lamprey life cycles are also really, really interesting. And this is why this is one of the reasons I got uh, uh, interested in these animals. 
lampreys have a really, really long larval period. And that transitions after going through a metamorphosis into a juvenile period. And that juvenile period is usually short. Uh, here I've said one to three years, and three is probably the maximum that any species of lamprey uses. And even within that, they probably don't use the full three years. They probably use about two and a half of it. At that point, uh, the juvenile is actually what we think of as a traditional fish. It's out in the ocean or it's out in the river. It's swimming around. It's feeding on other animals. This larval period, which actually dominates that life cycle, right, is actually spent as what looks like something that is a worm. It's burrowed into sediments. It's in streams. It's probably feeding on algae and detritus. It's growing relatively slowly. Um, and that that is out of sight and out of mind. You might have lots of them around. You may never have seen them. And then they go through and they become an adult at some point. They breed, and then that's the end of it, right? Lampreys are a one and done. So they go out and breed, and then they, they, uh, the, the, the offspring will hatch at that point. That's what we think of as a traditional lamprey life cycle. And this is the life cycle you'll see if you go into textbooks usually. Lampreys actually, probably most, if not uh, at least half of the species of lamprey, don't do that. Uh, they do some of that. They do the whole larvae thing, and then they say, you know what, the juvenile thing, we're not doing that. We're just going to go and become a breeding animal. And so they actually stay out of sight. And then only for a very short time, you actually see them, they emerge, they migrate to some spawning location, they breed, and then they're gone, right? They die, and that's the end of the whole thing. And that's, we, all, we have both kinds of lampreys in York. These animals are called non-parasitic because they never feed on another animal. The other animals are called parasitic because at some point in time, they feed on those animals. And that leads to some really interesting things. So lampreys have these really inter interesting trade-offs that come about. Non-parasitic animals, because they aren't feeding on, on really high-quality diet items, don't get very large. They just can't spend the time to get that big. But parasitics, which here I've called the river and the sea lampreys, uh, can get very, very large. Non-parasitics, which we generally call brook lampreys, don't. And probably non-parasitics don't go as far, right? If you're an animal that's 20 centimeters long, you probably just can't move as far as an animal that's two and a half feet long. There's probably quite a bit more movement you can do as a two and a half foot long animal. River lampreys, which live in rivers and lakes, they can be oceanic. I, here I put them in quotes, right? And, and do please note the quotes. It's not a real name. River lampreys, but these are shorter ranged animals that probably feed for a relatively short amount of time, but do pack on some weight and do adopt some, some amount of juvenile parasitism. And then the very, very high end, the very largest lampreys we have in the world, there aren't that many of them, are really oceanic migrants. And they go way out and they feed for years. And then at some point there's a trigger and they return to, an, to, the, to a stream side and, and they spawn there. So these differences in physical adult size are really important. That's cool. We like big adults. Those are neat. But what that actually does is that comes with huge differences in how much offspring uh, that you can actually deposit into the environment. So brook lampreys, really, a, a, an animal with 4,000 eggs, that's amazing. Wow, great work. You've done great stuff with your life. You're making a lot of offspring. But brook lampreys often are in the, the thousand offspring. You go into the big sea lampreys, 4,000 offspring would be a bust. That would be a complete waste of time. You're dealing with animals that are producing two, 300, maybe 400,000 eggs, right? So you get hugely different orders of magnitude. And in between, you have the river lampreys. And in both these slides, I've showed you that the boxes overlap. And that's true. In the wild, we do have species that seem to sit right on those lines. They seem to overlap. They look like really productive brook lamprey, but maybe they spend a long time being brook lamprey. And then there may be some river lampreys that look not that productive, but maybe they really don't feed very long and they just get a lot of bang for their buck on that short amount of feeding. And so uh, what this can tell you is that you have different payouts, right? So there's probably different payouts depending on what strategy you adopt. And that immediately is going to lead you to thinking, well, there might also be different costs. So why don't we just all be sea lampreys? Why aren't we all enormous sea lampreys and live in the, the high life producing lots of offspring? Well, there's probably costs associated with that. So one of the things that I looked at was I, I looked at the growth of lampreys and I looked at these guys uh, by actually individually marking these animals and looking at them through time. So lamprey growth rate in the amicy. So we're, I'm really talking about the amicy, which is that larval period. Uh, is very, very strongly dependent on density. This is not a particularly unusual curve, right? Lots of animals in your environment, they compete for resources, and your growth rate goes down. But amicies are, are very, very often at very high densities with each other. So they often run into this problem of having very, very high densities. 
and that means their growth rate drops. And that stinks if, you're, if you've got slow growth to begin with and now it's going to drop and this is the portion of your life stage where you just want to get through so that you can get out there and feed parasitically, that can be a problem for you. But you have to also keep in mind that density is partially driven by adult fecundity, right? So if you produce only a few eggs, your densities really are not going to be that high because you're just not going to have that many individuals out in the, in the environment. But if you're a sea lamprey and you produce 300,000 eggs in a single nest and those get washed downstream and all land in the same small area and they live there, well, that's an enormous problem. Now you have densities that are just every time you move, you hit another animal. And so that is really costly. And then, of course, one of the other things that lampreys can't necessarily control directly but can control it by how much they migrate is uh, the, the habitat availability. So if you're willing to go really long distances, you can recover some of that density, in a sense, by lowering it, by spreading your, your young out over large areas. But if you don't, if you say, well, I'm not going to go very far, right? this isn't worth the travel time for that, then you have the problem of everybody's going to be stacked up on top of each other. So we really do want to understand some of the elements about how they're moving within the environment and how that affects growth. So I'm going to talk to you, I really wanted to talk to you about a lot of stuff about movement and that kind of thing, but it, it gets very, very complicated. We're still going to have some of that in here, but I'm going to spend some time talking about growth because it's, it's, it's sort of really easy to get into the meat of growth and really enjoy learning about growth. So this is, uh, this is how I actually went out and marked the animals to do the growth studies. And this was, I went out and did uh, multi-pass depletions at site and recaptured animals, recaptured animals, recaptured animals at a site. So I'd mark an area within a stream and go and sample and sample and sample and sample those. Then I would leave and then I'd come back at a later time and do the same thing, sample and sample and sample and sample those. And those animals uh, would have things like length and weight taken and then I'd put them back where I found them, right? Presumably I didn't annoy them enough that they're different now from the environment action shots of me in here probably not real action shots by the way a lot of these are staged that one was actually real uh, kate actually took that picture while i was working so it's in effect real but a lot of these are just made up to provide opportunities for the presentation i'm just warning you i'm just warning you it's all smoke and mirrors animals also on their body so it's easy to find animals right it's easy to say well this animal is almost the same size it's almost the same weight as an animal i caught here last time is it the same animal right and we don't know and so one of the ways we can go about finding out is we can mark them and so what i effectively did is i gave lampreys little tattoos on their body they didn't have an option um, but the, the tattoos were related to uh, uh colors were related to numbers and therefore an animal could receive a unique id number at that location right and that could be used to generate information about what is an individual doing through time here i'm just going to briefly show you what this looks like so these are the tags along the side of the body i used three in a row um, and then I had, the, there was a, I used a separate tag to detect how badly I was doing at retaining tags. So how often do animals get rid of tags? Actually, they're not, uh, they do a pretty good job of holding on to these. And you can, these are different colors, right? And each color corresponds to a different value. And then the orientation, vertical or um, uh, horizontal or vertical, gives you also a different value. So a red horizontal is a different value from a red vertical. And by default, I said red verticals are, let me use the right hand side, red verticals are going to be ones, red horizontals are zeros. And you can do that. If you have five colors, then you get a base 10 system, right? And you can do, uh, you can come up with lots of different values. Okay, so this animal down here actually has a unique name. It's R042R, which means that it was tagged on the right side of the body. This is its number, 042, and R is just the retention tag, so I know that it's been tagged with a, a value so I can actually go and see if they're being retained. Yes, I know. Okay, and you can actually do this with lots of different animals. In fact, you can get really, really tiny, which is one of the advantages of this stuff. So this is a very, very small animal that I tagged, um, and this is not particularly uncommon. You can, in fact, tag animals as tiny. You have to be really careful, but you can do it. And I did this in a couple places in New York, and one of the reasons I didn't do this in a lot more is, unfortunately, where we're located in New York, we're central to an area that doesn't have a lot of lampreys around us, so we always have to drive to get some. Um, and tagging actually takes a lot of time. You actually spend a lot of time in the environment and spending a lot of time manipulating animals, going to a site, releasing animals, recovering animals, and then moving to a new site and doing the same thing. So it takes a little while to do that. But I did have uh, three sites. 
one of which was this site down here in the Genesee River, which is with a non-parasitic, never feeds uh, as an adult. Uh, most people don't know they're there, but if you go out right now, in fact, and walk around the stream, you would see them. And in fact, if you just kick some rocks, they would come shooting by you because they're looking all over the place to spawn, um, and they're very easy to find. And then the other two sites, one was located in the Hudson Valley, and one was located in the Delaware River, were for sea lamprey. And those are parasitic, those are oceanic, they go way out to the ocean, right? They're probably feeding on the animals um, along the, the continental shelf, and then at some point they return to a stream and spawn there. And I did this roughly at one month interval. So every site got visited at, at about one month intervals, um, except during the winter time. There's a couple reasons for that. And one of which is that animals are not responsive in the winter. And if you go out and actually try to collect them, you can end up killing them because you use a backpack shocker to do so. Uh, and if the animals don't move, they actually just, they get immobilized and actually killed inside the, inside the sediment. So we don't collect uh, in the winter time. All right, so let's talk about what I actually found So with growth. So let's look first at Dyke Creek. These are non-parasitic animals, spend their entire life, uh, probably in a, a relatively uh, limited area. This is a length frequency distribution. This gives you information about how fast animals are growing potentially. It also gives you information about how old animals are growing, right? If there's some relationship between how animals growing consistently year to year. And one of the things that you can do here is that these peaks are probably related to groups of animals that were all spawned at the same time and are probably all about the same age. And if you label these, what you find right, is these animals right here, I know that the smallest animals of the year have not yet come out because I know this was collected in July. So these were animals from last year that have made it through the winter and the spring. So these animals are all year one plus, right? So that's about a year. That's probably about two. And that's probably about three years if you just use length frequency. And I did say that, in fact, when I first looked at these. Um, but what I ended up doing is because I collected through an additional year, right, you can actually follow these very in a, same animals through time. And what you find is that they don't align with that second peak. Um, as you would expect, they shouldn't be, they, this is not a year two. Uh, in fact, that's probably um, a year three and a year four. So these animals are probably taking about four-ish or five years to get out there, uh, these small non-parasitic animals. And just to give you some idea, an animal that is, so this at this end here, this is 200 millimeters long. 200 millimeters long, if you caught a bluegill at 200 millimeters long, you would not be offended. You would say, this is not a bad sized fish. When you're dealing with an animal that's only in the thickness of a pencil, 200 millimeters long is not much biomass. That's a small amount. You're taking a long time to add just a little bit of biomass to your body. So those, those years really add up. And then what you can see here is in this first year, 2014, recruitment was basically zilch. There were no animals. It was a terrible year for recruitment at that site. But the following year was great, phenomenal. So recruitment in these populations is very variable. And it seems, at least in this population, for when I studied it, it's an off year. So every other year, there's a great uh, uh, sort of burst of new animals into these populations, right? That year two animal is probably one of those bad recruitment years in that way, which is not unusual for fish that they have lots of variability within the recruitment. Okay, and if you use uh, uh, different programs to actually do this, this is a Von Bertalanffy plot. If you do a fisheries management stuff, you'll see these before. But what this does is each one of these lines allows you to trace, again, trace those peaks through time. But what you can see is this estimates it at about four to five years to reach adulthood, which again is very close to what we just did with an eyeball. Um, and so that's good that we are in agreement over that. So for the animals in Dyke Creek, what we might be able to say is animals are probably taking four to five, maybe six, or maybe at the very upper end, seven years at the absolute most um, to reach maturity, but probably in the four to five year zone. So let's look at just this population in Aquaga Creek. Uh, and what you can see here is that, oh, okay, there's peaks here. Well, <laughs> the peaks don't seem to move and that's a problem. That means either the animals aren't growing, uh, which makes, only a little bit of sense in one way, uh, or that animals are growing really, 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 really slowly. And maybe that is in fact the case. So if these are year one animals, uh, again, I, the year zeros are sitting in here. I know that they are because they're easy to find every August. There's tons of very minute animals that suddenly appear and those are from the breeding season. Uh, that is probably year one, but it doesn't move. So year zero sits back there. So if you just say, okay, well, this is how much they grew in the growing season, right? That diagonal is the amount of growth that this population is able to do in the growing season. How long would it take them to get out here? This 120 cutoff is a point at which they undergo that metamorphosis and they can adopt that parasitic strategy. We know that for sea lamprey, that's, a, that's the absolute minimum they can be. 
How long would that take? Well, we can measure the distance, right? And it's it's stupidly long. Okay, so these are 25 years old. Is that what you're telling me that the animals here are 25 years old? That seems unlikely. Uh, but that that what it does warn you is that animals at these sites, and Aquaga Creek was very close to a breeding location. In fact, there were breeding animals there every year when I went. Uh, they are stuck in a rut in a sense. There's lots of animals always being dumped into the environment. These are very high density environments. They can't grow very well. And so they have to, they either have to be really good at growing and that probably comes at cost to other things, right? You can be really good at growth, but you probably give up on other stuff or you have to leave. And what this is showing you is uh, uh, growth rates average for all individuals through time at these sites. And what I want you to take away from this is I don't want to get you too worried about whether what is white and what is gray. But what I want you to see is that this, this orange line is zero growth. So animal, if, if the population is zero growth. So what we just looked at is growth rate to length frequency. And this is actually validated with that tagging stuff. So I have individuals and I've generated these by doing lots of lots of individuals. What you can see is if you're at Dyke Creek, that's great. Almost all the time, you're above that zero line, which means you're always putting biomass on, which is good. You want to always be putting biomass in. You want to always be filling the tank up. You don't want to be putting it down. If you're at Aquaga Creek, that's actually not always the case. Sometimes you barely hit zero, and sometimes you're net negative, and that's really bad. That's the worst case scenario. That's where you're not even growing. You're actually paying to be there. So it's, you put your money in the bank, and the bank says, and you're going to pay me to keep it here because I don't trust it. And that's a very big problem if you're a, if you're a lamprey. That's the worst case scenario you can be in. So Quagga Creek for these guys can be a real problem. I, have, I didn't show you Cedar Prime Brook. I did want to show you that, but again, we're time limited, so I'm not going to show you that. Uh, but it sits somewhere between the two. And that's a different site. There is some breeding, but I never saw breeding adults there. Uh, and so they're probably a little more dispersed and probably in that way, uh, the response is a little bit different. So what do we know from uh, the, this, this tagging study? Growth is really variable between sites, and it's probably variable even within streams at very close areas, right? So we probably have something like that going on. Length is not a reliable indicator of age. I think I convinced you with that, with the length frequency, that you're not going to be able to say, oh, I know how fast these animals grow. That animal out there is uh, year 24. That's not a good idea. That's a, that's a risky venture. But in some places, you do have consistent growth, like at Dyke Creek, and you might be able to, in that case, occasionally use length. But you have to be careful that you don't say, oh, there's three peaks here. That's three years, right? You have to be careful about that uh, in that way. Individuals at some sites have negative growth. And so that tells you something really important. That tells you there's a real cost to being in some places. So there's probably all sorts of very interesting stuff that comes as a result of that. And then AMC growth places and where we expect. We, if you ask people, how long does it take a lamprey to become a parasitic if you're dealing with animals in the Great Lakes, or how long does it take them to be an adult? Probably takes them three to seven years. So these animals for New York, we're sort of at the, we're starting to get into cooler regions of, of North America. And so the, the temperatures are, are a little bit cooler uh, than what we see at the very southern ends of, of lamprey ranges. And so four to seven years is probably a really good estimate of how long these guys are taking. And probably four to five um, is more likely. Although in some places, like I said, you might have really slow growth. And so animals may be stuck uh, and they may have to make some, uh, some really serious decisions about what they're about to do. Okay, so that was growth. And we've done growth before. This is not novel in the sense that suddenly someone went out and measured the growth of amicids. Wow, this is the first thing. But this is a growth of amicids with individual tags, and that is a little bit unique. Now we're going to look at amicids with individual tags, and that's going to allow us to look at how much they move uh, from the site that we're at. So tagging with a batch tag, which is uh, in a lot of fish cutting off a fin, like cutting off a finger, except your fingers would sort of grow. It would be a cutting off finger, and it would. I wouldn't be able to identify individuals, but I would be able to note if I had an individual tag or not. In this case, with an individual tag, I can actually know who's leaving the room, right? So if we have a bunch of people in the room, and I individually know everyone, and they leave, I can know the rate at which individuals are leaving, and so that's really important. One of the things I've been alluding to so far is how good are they at mixing, right? Mixing rates are important here. So you have lots of animals that are coming off a breeding area. They're going downstream. And, but how good are they about getting out into that habitat? So how good are they about dispersing themselves into the available habitat they have? Often we assume that they are very good at it, right? That this is perfect. 
But that's really not fair. Those are often poor assumptions. And you know that because you've experienced uh, mixing rates as an important part of your life. So we need to know the rate of mixing here. This is a good example of that. I, I don't know that with this picture you'll be able to see it. But what I wanted you to see is these are all young of year from exactly the same location. And when I measured these, some of these animals were almost twice as large as others. And yet they're all probably this, the literal same day old, right? That, I mean, these are animals. But the, the fact of the matter is, if you have animals that are doubling the rate of other animals, there are huge differences that are driving that. Doubling your rate in the course of 90 days, okay, well, that's different. Doubling your rate if you live five years, though, now that's a big difference. You're a lot bigger if you're double the rate of somebody else and you've done it for five years. You get to integrate that over all those different years. So mixing rate is really important to us, right? If you deal with coffee, if you deal with sugar, you know that mixing rate is a problem. You put the sugar in, you know that it's going to disperse, unless you really load up your coffee. You know it's going to disperse up through the coffee and, and, and make a, uh, an evenly dispersed homogeneous liquid, but it doesn't do it instantaneously. And that's actually important depending on how you want to drink your coffee. This is cream, obviously. I understand that. It works just as well in this case. Lampreys also don't mix homogeneously. These are animals that are returning to breed. So these are all animals that are stuck temporarily. And that temporary sticking it would be important, right? And so if you're a predator, that's really important. This is a good place to go. Animals are stuck here. They're crowded in together. So mixing rate is not universal. I don't have to hunt everywhere and look for animals. I just need to go where they get stuck, and they will be, they will be clumped up in that way. And so we might expect the same thing with amicids. I don't have a picture with amicids because it's harder to take pictures of mud and convince you that there are differences and densities within it. But... So if you're dealing with brook lampreys, right, here's a brook lamprey. These are the small non-parasitic. They have small numbers of eggs, right? And if you dump that into a cup, the density would be very low. If you take a river lamprey species, they're about a ten, an order of magnitude higher of eggs, right? You dump those into the cup, and the densities uh, would be quite different, right? That color would be quite different between the cups. Here at the top is the ratio, so it's a 1 to 11 ratio. Well, if you compare that to things like sea lampreys, well, this is an even bigger problem, right? If you have 200,000 eggs and you dump that into a cup, that's a problem. Uh, that puts a lot of animals. So how do you get, how, how come you don't just always have brook lampreys? So this seems like always an issue. This is a problem. All right, I've got lots of eggs. I don't want that. I want lots of eggs, but I don't want all the problems associated with density. Well, actually, keep in mind that cup size is driven by movement, right? So it's about how much you move within your environment. So if you're moving a lot, then you would need to, if you're a sea lamprey, for instance, you need to move a lot. You need to get out and across this entire volume. If you're a brook lamprey, you can move very little and receive the same benefit in that case. You can spend much less on movement, and that way you can scale your cup down, and that's how you would get the same color in this sense, that's in that way. And then you normalize by density. So animal number, if this is, this is sort of a, a, an idea of what it would look like. If you're at the day that animals are spawning, animal number right on the spawning ground is super high. Right. And then at some point in the future, day X, that number drops. And that's driven by a couple of things. One is uh, the dispersion of those animals. And that's what, this, what I tried to look at, how fast animals could leave the site. And the other one was mortality. And I would like to deal with that. Um, and this, the, the estimates I generated are really confounded. They have both dispersion and mortality together at the same time, although probably most of it is dispersion. Um, but to get to separate those apart is hard, and, and that's one of the, the things that, that still needs to be done uh, for these guys. And then the what pulls the tail out is dispersion, right? So what's pulling that forward is dispersion, and what's lowering it is two things at the same time. And the way we can actually go about doing that is we consider an organism as alive or dead. So we don't have to deal with the Schrodinger cat problem of is it alive and dead at the same time. And in fact, it is alive and dead at the same time. But uh, we're going to pretend like there's an alive and dead state. But we don't always know if an organism is an alive and dead state, right? Right here, we all know that we're alive because we can see each other, right? But if I asked you about an individual who you can't see, you have to make a prediction based about that individual. And if I tell you that you might be able to know that that person, you might be able to meet that person, confirm your prediction, but sometimes I'm not going to let you. And then you're going to have to make a prediction again, right? And that's sort of the problems that we're running into. I can't always be sure that I'll get every single animal I've tagged, right? I can't know that every animal I put out, I will get back in hand. And so I have to make a prediction about it. And that way, so we can what I'm really interested in is, is whether an animal is dead and dead to the model, which is actually not here. 
not here. So it's not in the area. I didn't recapture it. And that comes with this five sig signal. And that's what we call parent survival. Animals are definitely alive because I have them. Um, but they could also be apparently dead because they're not here. But that could be driven either by them being dead or not being here. And it's like if you had a coin that you could flip, but sometimes the box is obscured and I told you, what's a, what's, is a heads or tails? And you said, well, just show me what's in the box. I can't do that. And that's, a, that's what we're sort of dealing with in wild populations in that way. So we have a percent chance to capture an organism, and that confounds our estimate of uh, whether the organism is alive or dead, but that's how these models operate. Okay. So I use this, um, and what you get is you get an estimate of the apparent survival uh, between events. So when you go out, you have a, you capture some animals, you capture some animals at another time, and then between those times, you have an estimate of the apparent survival. When you're actually out at that site, you can estimate how good you are at bringing them in, how good you are at collecting those animals, so you can actually estimate that apparent sur survival estimate appropriately. Again, this is the sampling that you saw before. This is the same. I, when I was going out, these were the data that I was collecting. I did this at two sites 11 times and one site six times. Okay, and then these are, this is actually an underwater picture of these animals being released once they're uh, resuscitated. You can see that they're very, quite happy um, to go burrow back under the sediments. And then what I want you to see here is that I, I marked a lot of lampreys. I mean, I, we put a lot of lampreys out into that stream. There's 970 individuals that were individually marked. These are individually marked. I also marked very, very small animals slightly differently, but I'm not including those here. And I have 1,500, about 1,400, 1,500 records. Most of those records are one-off. Animals are captured once, and then they're gone. So animals are dispersing. Um, they're probably not dying uh, that fast. But I do capture some animals again. OK, so animals are there. Very rarely do I capture animals over and over and over and over and over again at the same location. Eight is the upper limit. Never caught an animal more than eight times. And it is interesting. You get the same animal. You put it back, you get it back in your hand. But those are rare events. Most of the time, you put an animal in, and it's gone. All that work that you did for that animal is gone. You don't get any more information from it. Let me, the, the way that we did these models is it, there's a lot of different ways you can test different things. Um, you can assume things are static or not. Let me show you the model results and explain them to you as opposed to stepping through these one at a time. I think you'll get bored. Uh, but the models allow, I'm not going to deal with AIC. Uh, or the number of parameters here, because I, again, I think for the, the purpose of what we're going to do, um, we're going to be focused on the model itself. So up here at the top, what I'm going to show you is this: the phi signal is, again, the thing that really, really interested in. That's the apparent survival. So how, how likely are animals to stay and remain at a site and live there? The other thing is that probability of capture. How likely am I to get those animals? How likely are we to actually capture them in time? This up here, this is a Quagga Creek. This is for sea lampreys. This is in the Delaware River. These are parasitic animals. What you see is a probability of um, capture. It varies with time. Um, and the, the apparent survival is associated with what I've, I have here listed as G, which is groups. And groups were locations within my stream, so pools that I went to and sampled. So that's a group. This is a pool. That's a pool. This is a pool. That is a pool. Right? Those are different groups. In the AIC values, the, the rule of thumb of AIC uh, would say if it's under two, you just ignore it. It's a way of detecting how good we are at, at different models are against each other. If you're at six, they're actually, they're starting to be pretty different, and you go for the lower AIC value. So this upper model, which says that pools are different for apparent survival. You survive differently depending on where, what pool you are at this site. And you're also, you, Tom, are, are capturing them um, at differently at different times of the year, which I could have told you. So let's look at that. So that's good. So sample area, which is the pool in this case, is variable. In some sample areas, apparent survivals are basically zero. If you put an animal there, it will leave. It is never going to stay. It, it will not stay in that area. If you go to other areas, you can see you're getting about 60, maybe almost up to 70 percent uh, retention at that area between sample events. So between months, 70 percent of your animals are going to hang out there, right? They don't go anywhere. And th these pools here, uh, number 10, um, and number six are actually cut off uh, from the streams by and large. Now, if it rained and the water level came up, they can go away. Uh, but most of the time, water level is very, very low. And if animals were trying to escape from those, they'd have to go over small barriers. And they might actually be exposed temporarily to the air if you're even a moderately sized animal. So those really do have very high apparent survival. That makes sense. Animals don't want to move. 
And what you can see is that your probability of capture varies. So in the summer, when water temperatures are warm, when animals are active, when they're coming out, my probability of capture is good. I'm good at getting them. As soon as it gets cooler, I'm not very good at getting them, right? They don't come out. The response is, I'm not coming out. Now, you can shock me as many times as you want. I'm just going to sit here. And that's sort of one of the things that I began to realize. And one of the reasons I started to, to limit the amount of shocking I did is because I knew that animals were being very slow to respond to shocking. Even when you were there over and over again, they just would not come out. So I would leave them in that way. This is the other model. Uh, it shows a similar pattern. Uh, in this case, Pools are still important, but it adds the additional problem of pools are important, but at time. So you have to be at the right place at the right time. That's cool, really interesting stuff. But to estimate that many parameters, you need you need many more samples than I took, right? And I didn't do a small number, so you would need to double, triple, or quadruple the number of animals I had to, to get into that. So th this model, as it stands, is is it's not unreliable, but its estimates are broad because it's not able to narrow those questions down. Um, the same answer about what, when was I good at capturing them is the same as the other one. It says the same thing. If you're in the winter, it's harder, and if you're in the summer, it's easier. And you know that because if you go in the summer and you shock, boom, animals are all over the place. And you go in the fall and you shock, and you can sit there for two minutes and nothing happens. And you could, you know, you've got, you know, there are animals right there. They're right there. So what do you get? What's the summary? VIE, which is what I use, these tattoos are actually really good at, ta at uh, marking amices. Um, and they can do it over uh, multi-year periods, probably a couple-year period. They're probably pretty effective for that. Sites were different from one another. I didn't show you that, but I think that what I'm alluding to by only showing you one site is that sites were different. And so if you were to look in the thesis or in the dissertation itself, you'll see that they're actually quite different from each other, which is interesting and is good, right? Based on what I was telling you about, well, cup sizes are different. Maybe that, no, they should be different. They are experiencing different types of life histories. And so their response in their environment should be different. They should do different things there. Animals move most often in the spring and the fall. So if you are looking to capture the same amicete over and over and over and over again, go in the summer. They don't move. Unless it rains a lot, they really aren't moving. If you go in the spring and you put animals out, that's it. They're gone. I put animals out in May, came back in June. We had one moderate rain event, just a very moderate rain event between when I went out. I got almost nothing back, right? Boom, rains are there. Temperatures are right. I'm out of here, right? And that's what can happen in that case. Winter flows, though, don't seem to do that. So temperatures come too low, animals don't leave. They're, they're committed to that area for the rest of that winter. Um, and then finally, the long-term marking with unique tags would be really nice for amicetes, obviously, because you get a lot of information about them. But one, the, the sort of holy grail of this kind of stuff would be marking of animals where I don't actually have to go and electroshock them, right? Where I would just pass something over top of them, and I would get hits. This animal's here, this animal's here, this animal's here. You get exact location at that moment, and you would avoid the need to constantly resample, and then you could increase the number of sample times, right? Because you're not disturbing the animal, and you can do it lots and lots. So that would be the holy grail of that kind of work. So apologies, Deb, because I know that this I had to cut out materials that we did together um, that dealt with the marking of animals at, uh, or looking at juveniles. So how can we look at whether juveniles are moving around a lot or not? What I'm going to move on to is life history modeling. And life history modeling uh, here, what, what we want to understand is, okay, I told you there are a lot of trade-offs in lampreys, and there appear to be many. Uh, and now one thing that we can ask is, uh, can we actually model whether animals should adopt certain behaviors or not. When is it good to adopt one behavior? When is it good to adopt another behavior? And this is a really good example of the contrast and difference. This is an American brook lamprey. Right? This is as big as they get. This is a sea lamprey. This is not as big as they get. Both of these will be breeding adults. Right? This, this animal, in fact, was breeding. I picked it off the nest. This animal was not breeding, but would have, but would have the following year and would have not gotten any larger. And what you can see is, right, so this is my foot in both cases. There are enormous differences in sizes. So there are really big differences in payout. You have, you're playing different lottery games, right? This is the local Powerball um, scratch-off ticket. This is the state level, right? You're making it big. You're doing that billion-dollar jackpot. Right, and just to remind you again, brook lampreys, non-parasitics tend to sit down here where the, the output is small, but probably the risk is lower. And, when, and I'll talk about what I mean by risk. And then up here, 
um, parasitics like the sea lampreys are doing really high risk, really high reward. And then there's some group of animals that are sitting between them. And so what, it, what are we even uh, talking about in that case? So let's look at, this is a phylogeny of lampreys, right? And so this shows you relatedness to one another. I want you to get too bogged down in it other than to say that all the red animals are parasitic animals. And all the black animals are non-parasitic, as far as we can tell. And that would be really, really nice if non-parasitics and parasitics did not overlap with one another very much in the sense that I should not get parasitics species that are more closely related to non-parasitics than to themselves in that case. In fact, that's what you do find. Um, if, you look at just, if you look at this first group up here, this parasitic species in Victoria, Australia, is less closely related to its own parasitic species than in, new, in, in another location in Australia. That's a problem. That means that this species is less closely related to itself than this species is to another species, but it depends on where you are. Right? And so that would suggest that that's not a species then. What you're dealing with is something very different. You're dealing with um, a, a plastic response to an environmental cue. I'm seeing something different. I do different things. I look the same as somebody else. But that's just the way it is. That doesn't mean I'm actually that closely related to them. This is in Australia, but this happens all over the place. We have all sorts of these problems um, within, within lampreys. So when I told you that about half of lampreys were non-parasitic, that's true. Um, if the species exist, if they're not just conglomerates of other species that have different life histories. And that appears to be the case for at least a few species. Um, and it, even in New York, we have, in fact, four species that may eventually be condensed into two species because we can't genetically differentiate them. You can give me a non-parasitic and a parasitic, and if I look at it genetically, I'd say I have no idea. These are more closely related to each other than they are to another individual in the same stream. But... If you give them to me physically, I'll say, well, obviously, this is a non look at the size of this thing. It's parasitic, and here's a non-parasitic. Yeah, those are different species. That's an obvious difference. Well, here's an example of that. This is, uh, this is one from North America. Here's a paired species. The parasitic is on top. The non-parasitic is on bottom. Non-parasitic is grainy because we don't often don't have a lot of pictures of non-parasitics. A lot of people don't go out and take them. That's why I've actually added... Uh, a lot of pictures to my blog so that I have a record of these animals and I can draw from them for presentations. But just to your general appearance, these animals look very similar. I've scaled them to the same size, so they're not actually this size. If you look at the oral discs, right, so we're not looking at jaws, but if you look at the oral discs, to your first glance, okay, these look exactly the same. They are very closely related. They are clearly closely related in that way. But look at how strong the, um, the points on these teeth are. And here's a non-parasitic. And look at how weak those points are. In fact, all of those points right there are gone. They're just abraded away. Uh, and that's because those teeth really don't grow that sharp. These animals can cut your finger. These animals you, can't, you can almost not feel uh, for their teeth because they're so blunt compared to the other ones. So there are very distinct differences within the, te the teeth pattern there. The other problem is if you look at a non-parasitic, I told you non-parasitics don't move much. At least that makes sense, right? They shouldn't move very much. Um, and I didn't find them moving very much. But you have a population in Wisconsin, and its nearest neighbor is probably somewhere down here in Missouri. So you're saying to me that either an animal swam all the way up the Mississippi before dams were put in place, and now it lives in Wisconsin, or animals establish a population in Wisconsin, as, as, uh, or the, that the animals establish populations in between, and all of the other populations that ever existed between those went extinct. None of them exist now. And that's just your bad luck. You didn't happen to find them before they went extinct. And that doesn't seem as likely because these are well distributed throughout here, right? And so we don't necessarily expect there to be these really disjoint uh, uh, ranges. But it does make a lot of sense if you overlay what is apparently the parasitic that is a different species on top of that. Oh, parasitic does travel up the Mississippi River and all over the place. And it does make it possible that if these are one and the same species, they're able to deposit these different life histories in different areas depending on whether those are successful there or not. So the animals that I looked at uh, are in this orange box. These are all of the, the groups that are in the northern hemisphere. Uh, I looked at, uh, uh, for the modeling purposes, I looked at, at and what I'm going to show you today is this thing called a chestnut lamprey. Turns out the reason, the reason I did that is not because I have a, a particular fascination with chestnut lamprey. We don't actually have them in New York. Uh, but 
what they are really nice is that there is a, a very good study that looked at mortality rates in juveniles, so that feeding period, and that's actually really rare in lampreys, and so I could draw on that information. So I had really good information about mortality rates, and really, really good information about growth rates, and those two pieces allow you to make some predictions within a model. And then uh, I also wanted to talk about this, but I don't think we'll get to it. That's a sea lamprey. And then the one, the, the Lefentron appendix is a American brook lamprey, and I won't talk about that. Let's talk a little bit about this model. So life history models work really, really well, um, potentially, but life histories are also infinitely complex depending on what you look at. There's an infinite number of strategies that could be adopted. So how do we try to deal with some of that problem, right? Bifurcation is a real issue. So we need to go in and, and trim the tree in that way. And how do we pick a better strategy? So what's a better strategy? And, and, and that's something that we have to decide on. What's the payout that the model will decide on? And then finally, what are we going to use as the currency of the benefit? For humans, it's easy to look at it and say, well, money is a benefit, right? It was money because money drives this. And this. But for animals, animals don't regularly carry around dollar bills. They don't usually carry wallets with them. Um, and as a result of that, you have to have some other benefit. Actually, in biology, benefit is very easy to define. It's offspring, right? It's always the number of offspring. So what I use for this model is as, as a series of Markov chains. And Markov chains um, are, I'm not going to really deal with that, but what I just want you to see is it's a fairly logical progression. You can move um, from one location to another. In this case, you can move from one life history stage to another, or you can return to your life history stage. So you can re be reconsumed within that. That way you can have an amicete. In this case, the larvae become a, remain a larvae. Um, and so this is by yearly steps. So it remains a larvae for every year. Or it can undergo a metamorphosis. And if it does that, then it's allowed to become a juvenile or adult. If it becomes an adult, it's terminal. Boom, we're done. Answer is right there. We can, we can talk about what that will be. And we'll talk about what the benefit, how we calculate the benefit. If you have a juvenile, it's a very similar process. You do this for, uh, you can say it becomes a juvenile or adult again, and then at some point you terminate that and say all juveniles have to at some point become an adult. Right? And all amicetes at some point have to become an adult through some pathway. So we artificially limit the number of pathways that are available, and that's what we end up using uh, to prevent that infinite bush from appearing that way. So for biological systems, what's important? Fitness is important. It's measured in offspring. How many individuals can I dump out into the environment? And that's what I'm going to use here as my benefit. Offspring are actually very closely related to how much weight you can bring to the table, right? Because weight is related to how much energy reserves you have, how many energy reserves you have, is how much you can donate into the reproductive game. So if you imagine this as an opportunity to spend your resources to buy something, if you have more weight, you have more money to push around. You can say, I want more of that. And then what you want more of is offspring. And so you can buy more offspring. You're a little skinny guy. You don't get many offspring. Right? That's that's a, a sad fact of life. In that way. And so here, uh, what we'll do, and we can deal with this, is relative fecundity. So I deal with a value of how many eggs per gram of body weight you can produce. And the cost of getting that benefit. So I've told you what the benefit is. Great. I want that benefit. But you don't always get that benefit. That's dependent on whether you survive to that time. Right. It's not that you always get it. It's whether you're lucky enough to make it there or not. And so it's a, it's a simple problem with uh, probability again. The odds of you getting uh, heads, heads is 25%. The odds of you getting heads, tails is 25%. The odds of you getting tails, heads is 25%. The odds of you getting tails, tails is 25%. doesn't mean that that's how it's always going to come out, but that's how you calculate it. You say there's a 50% chance that I'll get heads or tails here. Um, and if I, if I say there's a 50% chance of me getting tails, and a 50% of me getting tails on the second time, the odds of me getting two consecutive tails is 25% in that way. And we can do that with life histories, right? The odds of you making it from one year to the next is the odds of you living from one year to the next year. And every consecutive year that you add, you multiply those together to get the odds of you making it to that final year. And I will warn you that for fish, that's going to be a very low number because you are not dealing with 99% survival like you see in human populations. You're dealing with a great year of 50% survival. That's really great. You've done work, good work this year. So in that case, I just showed you that. Uh, and that what we can do uh, with these things is we can get these survivals from year to year, right? So if we have those survivals, we can multiply them together. And then we get an average benefit for that outcome. So we take the odds of surviving times the maximum benefit for survival. We multiply those together. That is the average 
benefit for animals that adopt that strategy. And that avoids the need to have individuals in your model because you can deal with averages. You can say, well, we could look at this from an individual perspective. And that may be important when you're dealing with very, very small numbers of uh, animals, right? It could just be luck. If you have two animals and they're, one's adopting a really great strategy and one's adopting a really bad strategy, it really doesn't matter if this animal dies because you stepped on it. Right? The bad strategy just won. Right? But if you're dealing with millions and millions of animals, we can ignore all that and say, ignore any of these random small stochastic events that cause things to suddenly disappear, reappear. Let's just look at it in a broad sense. What would be the best option if I did this a million times? What would be the best opportunity for me to adopt in that way? It's the same way here, right? So if most of the animals die, but one gets a benefit of 100, the average benefit is 25. Or you could say the odds of you getting there is 25%. The outcome would be 100 if you got there. So the average benefit in that way is 25. So hopefully I convinced you that those are the same. And then, of course, one of the things that this links us back into is growth rate, right? We really want to know growth rate because that's really, 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 really important for estimating these different, for estimating when populations do well in that case. So this is the parameters for the model. I wanted to step through these, but I think it's, it's on the small screen and with a, the limited amount of time we have, let's not be too worried about it. But let me just say what we do within the model is I have some initial weight for animals. There's some growth rate for, for different life stages. They have some different growing period, so the amount of weight that you can put on per year is different. And then there's some survival rate for each life stage. So how likely you are to make it to that terminal uh, stage is based on those different values. So let's go through these um, and, and not uh, step through each one individually. And then you dump this into a model, right? So this is the actual model in R. And you, R doesn't have to be black, so it could have been white with blue font, but it's black with purple font here. Um, and what I actually did was build this into a user interface uh, so that you could actually build out um, and, and do this without having to go into the code itself. And that makes it much easier to deal with. And like you can see here is we can set the number of model iterations. So you can set how many times you want to run the model. You want to run it a billion times and see what the odds are. And that will give you distributions of the best strategies around some point, right? Because you can run it over and over and over and over again. And that seems like, well, that's fantasy. But think about the, the lifespan of a species, right? They have a separate amount of time that they may be a generational period of four to five years over the course of millions of years, that's billions of iterations, right? Billions and billions of billions of individuals are trying different things. And the ones that are successful are winning out. And so even though these numbers, you know, you're dealing with thousands or millions of iterations seems high, actually in the course of natural selection, that's not high. And that's how you get those really finely attuned peaks, right? Because you can, you can select for very specific things. So let's talk about the results because that's what you want to see. I looked at a population of chestnut lamprey that um, an individual named Paul looked at for his actual dissertation work. And what he found was um, the, the chestnut lamprey adopted parasitic strategies. He went out and fed. He never found, as far as he could tell, non-parasitic chestnut lampreys. Okay. So the model should produce that. And what I have here is this is the adult weight that the model produces. So this is the, the weight the model says you should be this when you're an adult. And this is the counts based on the number of iterations you ran. So I ran a thousand iterations for this one. The gray ones are non-parasitic. And the black ones, which you can barely see, are parasitic. So that tells you that my model is saying, Hall's population, you're wrong. They're doing it wrong. You should have been non-parasitic. You should have looked into this model before you did that. And that seems to present a real problem right away, right? So I have the most data on this population. This is it. This is the model. I can build the model off this group because I have the most data for it. And the model provides you very little support that that's the, the strategy that population should adopt. So there's something wrong. Then the model is wrong. Maybe. Um, and let me just point this out. Yeah, so you can actually see individual. So that's individuals out of thousands of iterations that were successful with these parasitic strategies. So don't be parasitic. Well, if you look at Hall, so this is my length, weight, frequencies for American Brook Lamprey, non-parasitic that I collected. If you look at Hall stuff, his animals actually, for the adult chestnut lamprey, after they have fed parasitically, after they are adults, they end up right there, right in the middle of where my non-parasitic American brook lampreys are saying, it's time, to, it's time to do it. It's time to go and reproduce, right? His largest lampreys are smaller than my smaller American brook lamprey adults. They are tiny. They're little tiny guys that go out and feed parasitically. And if you look at the literature on American on chestnut lamprey, you'll find that 
there are actually no other reports that I know of of chestnut lamprey that small. These are unusually small chestnut lamprey. This orange circle is where I've seen all the reports uh, within the other population. Now, this is not a particularly well-studied species, but I don't know of any other reports of animals that small as adults. And in fact, if you look closer, those extremes are unusual. That's the max-min values that we know of. Those are the ones where people say, wow, it's a really small animal. I should report that because that's pretty cool. Wow, it's a really big animal. I should report that, but that's really cool. But it's not really that cool because those are not the ones that are adopting the average strategy. Those are either the really unlucky or the really lucky guys, right? Those are the stochastically lucky or unlucky individuals. Not as interesting. Them. Interesting in this egg in the middle here, this, this orange area, and those animals are quite distant from the ones um, that I, I used within my model. So maybe the model is right. The model's right in a sense. It's taking it and saying, if you have an animal that acts like an American brook lamprey, it should be an American brook lamprey. It should do the non-parasitic thing. And for Hall's population, that raises all sorts of interesting questions. Why are his animals different? And if you look at something like a sensitivity analysis, and you say, why doesn't his animal do the same thing? Um, and you look at juvenile survival, so that's that parasitic survival, versus amicete uh, survival. And this, this one is one with a high amicete growth rate, and this is one with a low amicete growth rate. And the size of these circles is related to the length of the lifespan. That's fine. That's cool. But what we really want is this gray area. And the gray area is important because that tells you where the animal should be parasitic. And if you look at Hall's population with fast growth rate, um, his juvenile survival was about 8 to 9 percent, so it would put you in right at about here, at this line right here. And uh, what you'll find is that amicete survivals, we think they're not well estimated, are probably in about the 50 percent zone. So if you're there for Hall's population and you have relatively high amicete growth rate, you should be non-parasitic. But if Hall's population was coming from an amicete with growth rates that were well, about half of that, right, or, or, or lower, then what you find is suddenly the parasitic option is much more attractive, right? You can't make it as an amc. You do have another option, right? And so that gives you some information about Hall's population. Maybe he's dealing with a population that has very, very slow amc growth or survival because in the model those are treated very similarly. Maybe he's dealing with a population that's unusual right now because it is in the in the process of becoming a new species in that way. This is these populations are recovering glacial species, right? So the glaciers did not retreat that long ago, right? The Great Lakes, as you see them, have not been the Great Lakes as you see them for any amount of time. We think of them as changing rapidly. They have, but they changed a lot when humans weren't here too. And so even places like Michigan, where these animals are coming from look nothing like they did a thousand years ago or five thousand years ago these are new things these are new animals on the landscape so they are doing something different and it may be that they are simply not adapted to their environment they are maladapted they are still adopting different things that will allow them to be adapted don't know that we'd have to look at the population so what does that tell you uh, lamprey populations show a lot of flexibility within that uh, based on this modeling that there's a lot of areas that they are flexible in uh, if you make some slight changes within the model. Non-parasitic and parasitic animals can work in the same population. You can do it. You can get a species that looks radically different, that adopts two different strategies, but is one species. Just depends on how well you're doing at different times. And one of the things that may drive that is how fast you grow as an AMC. You grow really poor, you give up. You say, it's not worth it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to risk it. We're doing it big. We're, gonna, we're doing the juvenile thing. If you're doing really well as an AMC, you say, why would I bother to give up? This is the high life. I am a low risk environment and I'm growing well. I don't have to leave the area where I'm going to breed very soon and I'll just come back and breed right here. And so in that way, non-parasitic and parasitic environments from this or, uh, animals from this model are supported. So that would that is at least in line with what we start starting to believe is actually out there. And then current survival estimates that we have for these animals do seem to be reasonable. We're in some ballpark figure area that does make sense, uh, but we need better estimates of those. Okay, this is a sea lamprey nest. You can actually still see these in this. This is photographed months after it's over, um, but they dig large nests and leave them there, and then they're very easy to find later. In fact, if you ever go into a uh, river with sea lampreys that are common, um, you may walk along a riffle, and then suddenly your fit will dip into feet, and you'll be up to your knee or something, and that may, in fact, just be a sea lamprey nest that's, that was used. Uh, they leave them uh, all around because they make them all up and down every riffle. Okay, so what's the takeaway message? Lampreys are an ancient group, right? So this, I, I, I think that what you can see is that they're sort of weird and unusual, but they're not simple. Uh, they're not easy to understand just because they're old. That's not the case. 
we do need a lot of work to do on, uh, we, and we have a lot of work to do on survival estimates. And that's something that I am showing you that there are maybe some tools that we can get into that would look at that. I don't have them, I have not yet done that. So maybe that's, that's a direction we need to go. And certainly for unusual population, like that chestnut lamprey population, really deserve more study, right? That's a really interesting thing within the, the environment. Lamprey growth, I think you will be also be convinced is highly variable, and that's really useful if you're trying to build uh, uh, plasticity into phenotypes, because you don't know what you're going to get until you go out and try it, and there's lots of different opportunities out there. And then that leads to huge differences in age. Age and growth is really important for survival, and survival and age and growth all come together to be really important for the odds of getting a payout, which is a number of offspring. And then probably that has been one of the leading drivers of why you have uh, so many different feeding strategies in lamprey. So that's it. I know that we are behind time um, in that way, and I apologize for that. But I do want to thank uh, the Great Lakes Science Commission. I didn't show their data here, but they were they funded part of my dissertation. So uh, and they continue to be a group that I talk to. They do a lot of work on sea lamprey, of course, which is a problem for the Great Lakes. Hudson River Foundation funded a lot of that, uh, the material that you saw, and also some material that you didn't see. And so I would like to thank them as well. Um, and they, they were very generous in their support. And then, of course, ESF, through various means, provided support to me, um, as well as the members that are also up here. Um, including the Sussman Foundation as well. And then actually many, if not all of you, have provided support for me at some point in this dissertation, uh, whether it be through talking with you or struggling with, with uh, problems that you may have had. But what you didn't realize is that I often had the same problems and that struggling with the uh, problems that you had, I also had to deal with my own problems. And it was a really good learning experience for me um, to, to get feedback from you and to get a completely different perspective on that. So thank you as well. And thank you also for your time. And that is the end. You're the best. Yeah, you mean when they're adults or when they're larvae? Well, Probably you know, both. When they're larvae, they're kind of buried. They come out and uh, right. be an adult and they're spawning. So predators go after them at that time? Or do you think they're going to be able to overlap? So that would, yeah, so in my experience with brook lampreys, um, and it, in the literature, brook lampreys tend to move at night. And that is probably to avoid predation in part. But if you go out towards the middle or the end of the spawning season, animals are moving all the time and they have no options, right? They're trying to get to a breeding location. They're running out of time. Temperatures are warming up. They got to get the eggs in the ground or they're going to die. And that's the end of it. And they and so probably everything. Uh, the, the animals that I have seen uh, are uh, very concerned about any movement towards them. So if you walk by them, that makes them startle. They don't really like that. I suspect that whenever they're swimming through pools as they're moving up and they're being exposed to things like basses and trout, um, that that's a real problem, that they are very happy to pick them off. When they're actually burrowed as larvae, I don't know. Probably a lot of stuff. Um, catfishes probably do a pretty good job on them. And certainly when they're little guys and they're being washed around a lot, uh, that's probably everybody. They probably really get chomped on by minnows especially. Uh, when they're being flushed around the stream in that case. But I have captured animals with bite marks on them. So they have this the, a nice little bite mark. So they've clearly been clamped onto and the animals gotten away. I've gotten animals that have been amputated. So parts of their tail have been cut off. And from my own experience, animals really dislike um, actually contact. Even when they're fully anesthetized, contact with the tail triggers a response. They still respond to that and they'll twitch very broadly. So I expect what happens is they hit the substrate and they try to get into it and the predator grabs them by the tail. And so it's a very strong response to try to just flex and get that animal off so they have another chance to get under the ground in that sense. So they are um, probably consumed by a lot of different things, but I don't know that we have good information about what particularly eats them. Sure. Right, and I think that's a fair question. 
you, you stock piscivores because that brings people to it. But I think actually one of the real problems for brook lampers is probably brown trout stocking or rainbow trout stocking. You're stocking, right, you're stocking big animals and they actually usually get stocked right at about the time that brook lamprey's are coming out, right? The, the springtime, temperatures are coming up, people are just going out to fish, brook lamprey's are on the move, 12 inch brown trout suddenly appears in the stream. And they are probably very hungry. <laughs> and a very, a, a relatively slow moving animal that is very focused on breeding is probably a great target for them in that way. Um, the, the growth curve that you showed for your American brook lamprey was awesome. <laughs> Um, and I was curious, since you said you, you were looking at a whole bunch of other lamprey species, um, did you see growth curves that showed um, where some of them were using this parasitic lifestyle and some of them were using this lifestyle? So that is, yeah, so if you look at sea lamprey, right, and what I found is that sea lamprey growth curves were different by sites. And in fact, one of them was different by year depending on when you went. And it may just be a matter of if you're willing to pack on more weight um, to length. So are you willing to keep putting on weight to length? Or do you say, this is really, really bad. I'm just getting out of here. Um, whatever the minimum is, I want that and then I'm out. Uh, and what would be really interesting is to have a population that you know does both and to get those curves and to get uh, animals that you've marked through time and know where they sit on those curves to see if they jump. Do they make jumps between them? And the other thing that would be really interesting, and I don't have it here, and it's because it's really hard to do, is sexing of animals. Because I strongly suspect that females are doing it differently. Males are probably doing it smaller. Um, they can probably get away with that. Females probably have to spend a little more time packing on a little bit more energy. They can do that in a single growing season, great. You know, they can recover that. But it may not be the case. And we know that lamprey sex is flexible. They're able to change it. And so that's another sort of... Uh, uh, tool that they probably have in the toolbox and allows them to cope with lots of different strategies. Conditions are really bad. Yeah, you could be parasitic. We could try changing sex first, see if that worked out for you. That didn't work out. Maybe we try, maybe we do the ju juvenile thing now. Maybe we do the parasitism. Um, and so the, that question of can we get different growth curves would be interesting to compare uh, with populations that we have in the Allegheny actually, because we know we have both species together, but they're separated by dams. So we know that they're not everywhere all the time together. So some populations are doing it, some are probably not. Are there any federal Paris lamprey? No, not to anyone's knowledge. And that is a that's a that's something that would be very interesting to know why that's the case. Uh, Iteroparity and semiparity and lampreys lampreys appear to be entirely commit to it. At most, the most we see is maybe Pacific lamprey. Uh, when they commit to breeding, some may breed one year and then they may just hang out and just barely make it into the next breeding year. And they never, never return to feed again. So whatever they brought to the table, they have to burn through. Once an animal commits to reproduction, all of its energy goes into reproduction and it, it's fully committed in that way. And we don't see that variability in any population as far as I know that there's a, uh, a, a reproductive event that occurs over and over again. Okay. Uh, I think that's about. I think it's probably a good time to uh, to wrap it up. And yeah. Thank you very much for a nice um, uh, seminar and uh, very technical stuff here, folks. But uh, the next time he does it, <laughs> so, so I think we'll uh, we will take a scroll down to the committee. will take a scroll down to the rest of you. I encourage you to eat donuts and muffins and things like that. Alrighty. That looks and like it for us. See that smile on your face? That means that your weight, weight on your shoulders has been lifted. No problem. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. Good. I'm glad.
Great. Leeches of the sea. It's on YouTube. It should be.